the sinking of the Titanic. You are there. Order Crime Cut reporting, April 14th, 1912. A new era has begun in ocean transportation as the famous British White Star liner Titanic begins its first run across the Atlantic Ocean. The biggest, fastest, most luxurious liner in the world. The Titanic is expected not only to break all existing speed records for passenger ships, but also to provide a model for future ocean travel in terms of comfort and, above all, of safety. Already dubbed the unsinkable ship, the Titanic is a marvel of marine engineering and craftsmanship. With this launching, man has taken another giant step forward in his conquest of space. Four days ago, the Titanic left Southampton, England, headed for New York City. At this moment, she's on the high seas. Well, this first trip is naturally a feeling out voyage, and it is doubtful whether the great ship will be pushed to her limits. Still, the posting of a good time for the trip will assure for its owners the fame and fortune predicted for the Titanic. Several reporters are on board the ship now, ready to bring you the latest reports of what may well be an epic-making transatlantic trip. All things are as they were then, except you are there. This is Fleet Roberts on the bridge of the Titanic somewhere in the North Atlantic. This is our fifth night out since leaving Southampton, and the voyage has been as pleasant as it's been uneventful. The weather has been very clear, although rather unusually cold for this time of year, and the ship has been making extremely good time. No one is predicting a record yet, but no one will be surprised if one is made. The officer you see there is Captain E.J. Smith, master of the Titanic. With him is Lord Bruce Ismay, chairman of the White Star Line, the company that, as you know, owns the Titanic. Uh, Captain Smith, sir, is the Titanic performing up to your expectations? If anything, beyond them. Do you think you'll break the record? Perhaps, perhaps not. I myself would be surprised if it were not broken. Do you know how much of a run we've made in the past 24 hours? 500 miles, sir. 500 miles. And 26. 526 miles. And we'll do more tomorrow, I promise you that. Unless, of course, the weather gets a bit sticky. Fog, you know, or a storm. Or ice. Have there been icebergs reported, sir? A few. We don't usually get them this far south, but this spring has been somewhat exceptional, I must say. Why is that, sir? Well, it all goes back two years when they had an unusually warm summer up north. Broke off whole islands of ice, I'm told. And, naturally, they drift their way down here. But they move so slowly it has taken them up until now to get here. Would they be much of a problem, sir? Oh, we travel so much faster than they do that, of course, we can get out of their way. Uh, speaking of being faster, could you tell me some of the other characteristics of the Titanic, some of the features which set her apart from other ships? Well, it's uh, hard to know where to begin. Roughly 46,000 tons, 882 feet long. That makes her the longest and largest ship afloat, doesn't it? It does indeed. And she's also the strongest. Heavy keel, reinforced inner and outer bottom. And haven't I heard something about a most efficient pumping system? Uh, yes. Very unusual. Very powerful pumps. Could pump enormous quantities of water out of them. And enough piping so that it could be led into any area in which she might be taking water. <laughs> As if she would, of course. Could you tell me something about the bulkheads? I understand they're far superior to those on any other ship. How many bulkheads does the Titanic have, Fifteen, my lord. Uh, transverse bulkheads, that is. Their watertight doors are electrically controlled, dividing her into uh, how many watertight compartments, Captain? Sixteen, my lord. Controlled by these switches in here, and so proportioned that any two of the largest could be completely flooded without affecting the ship's floating power. <laughs> we could strike Westminster Abbey itself and float home under our own steam. But, uh... But me no buts. You are on an unsinkable ship, my boy. There's a man on board wants to meet you. One of our stockholders. I think it might be wise. Well, you'll excuse us, won't you? Todd Hunter is in the main first-class salon with some of the distinguished passengers making this trip. Come in, Todd Hunter. The roster of passengers on this maiden voyage of the Titanic reads like a who's who of both British and American society. That's Colonel John Jacob Astor over there with his young bride. With him is Major Archibald Butt, personal aide to President Taft. Colonel Astor, what do you think of the Titanic? Magnificent. Everything they said she was. Britannia rules the waves, eh, Bud? Do you think America will be able to match it, Colonel? 
Beg your pardon, what'd you say? I say, do you think America will be able to match it? Why, uh, I imagine in due time, but right now the British are way ahead of us. On the seas, that is. It, uh, it is a magnificent ship. You hardly feel you're at sea at all. If you stay inside, well, uh, like never leaving the plaza. Isn't it, darling? Oh, I think she's just beautiful. That's the word, beautiful. They do a beautiful job, the British. You have to hand it to them. Thank you, Colonel and Mrs. Astor. And that is Mr. and Mrs. Strauss. As you know, Mr. Strauss is head of the famous New York department store, R.H. Macy and Company. Having a good trip, Mr. Strauss? Delightful. Couldn't imagine a better one. Are your quarters comfortable? No complaints about the food? <laughs> I haven't slept as well in years, or eaten as well either. Except, of course, when you've done the cooking. Pay no attention to him. I'm a terrible cook. Pay no attention to her. Best cook I ever saw. Why, I married her. Do you think the Titanic will start a trend toward liners of this size? <laughs> well, speaking as a businessman, of course, not as a sailor, the trend in everything is toward size. Everything's getting bigger these days, and better, too. Just look at the buildings going up. Why, 20 stories high is nothing. No telling where they'll stop. But isn't that dangerous, dear? Not if you know what you're doing. Why should things be so big? Well, in ships, in general, the bigger they are, the faster they go. Why should they be so fast? Oh, there you go again. Right to the heart of the matter. You should have been a lawyer, my dear. But you can still quote me on the Titanic. It's a miracle, and I'm grateful to be on it. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Strauss. The man just coming in from the deck is Frederick Hoyt of New York. Mr. Hoyt is the well-known naval architect. Oh, Mr. Hoyt. Yes? May I ask you a few questions? As a designer and builder of ships yourself, would you tell us, please, your impressions of the Titanic? Well, she's quite magnificent, of course. I, I was just having another look around her. She's absolutely the latest word. Do you think she merits the title, The Unsinkable Ship? Well, I imagine the Titanic comes as close to it as anything on the sea ever has. Do you have any reservations about anything? Well, there's a French restaurant, uh, a palm court, Turkish baths, electric baths, uh, squash courts. There's, <laughs> doesn't seem to be anything that anyone would want. I was talking about the ship itself, sir. Oh, you put me in a difficult position, being in the same line of business as it was. Any comment at all that you'd have? The Titanic has every modern improvement and every possible safety device. Uh, her chances of ever getting into any serious trouble are extremely remote. Thank you, Mr. Hoyt. Cleet Roberts has some information now from the bridge. Come in, Cleet Roberts. There have been a few developments up here that may be of interest in showing the operation of the Titanic, particularly when any special precautions have to be taken. We are now entering a great field of ice plotted by the ship's navigators as some 70 miles long and 12 miles wide. No ice has yet been seen, but Mr. Murdoch, the chief mate who has relieved Captain Smith on the bridge here, is ready to receive any warnings from the lookout up above in the crow's nest. Mr. Murdoch, how will you be informed if and when ice is sighted? Three bells from the lookout. He has a telephone up there, too. He can pick it up right here. Does he have enough visibility? There doesn't seem to be any moon. Oh, it's clear enough. You'd be surprised how far you can see from up there. And you can see better without the moon. It's, there's no reflection. Well, what do the navigators base their calculations on if no ice has been seen? Who oh, reports from other ships mostly. We've been getting them all day. One from the Coronia this morning. Others from the Masaba, the Baltic, the America. Also, the other ships, when they spot an ice field, they tell all the other ships about it. Then the temperature dropped uh, 11 degrees from uh, 6.30 to 9 tonight. That doesn't mean ice. I'm in the wrong business. Have any other precautions been taken, such as slowing down? Two hours ago, we were making 22 knots. We're making 24 and a half now. Isn't that dangerous with ice around? We maintain course and speed as long as visibility is good. But, uh... What would you have us do, mister? Come in late on the maiden voyage? What good is it building the biggest and best? She also isn't going to be the fastest. No way to make a million pounds. But if there's ice already reported... If there's ice, we'll see it. And if we don't see it... Well, mister, this ship is unsinkable, isn't it? Don't you read the newspapers? Haven't you read about it? Ice stop it! How to stop it! Put down the engines. Pull the stern. Pull the water tight doors. Water tight doors. What was that? Ice, sir. Those are all watertight doors, then. Doors closed, sir. Good. 
I'll go below and see what damage there is. Good thing we didn't hit head on. Yes, sir. Pull ahead. Pull ahead. And you're back on course. Back to course, sir. No need to get alarmed. You saw it wasn't much. Harlow Wilcox is in the wireless room to show us the workings of this new invention that has so greatly added to man's safety and ability to communicate. Come in, Harlow Wilcox. The wireless is a comparatively new thing on ships, as you know, and it's rare to find a wireless operator of advanced years. The young man here is John Phillips, the Titanic's chief operator who has just come on duty. He and his assistant, Harold Bride, have been very busy on this maiden voyage. Mr. Phillips, what kind of messages are you sending or receiving now? Mostly personal or business messages from the passengers to the States. Are you in touch with other ships as well? We gab about a bit. Here, gab a bit with these. Right you are, Stuart. I say, you feel this hippie thing just now? Seems to me we shivered as if we'd brushed something. You'd shiver too if you were down in that water. Just like the middle of winter out there. Seems to me we're slowing as well. Mr. Phillips, we struck an iceberg. Stand by to send out a call for assistance. But don't do anything until you get word from me. It may not be necessary. Stuart, you stand by here for further orders. Yes, sir. We stopped. Well, whatever it was can't be more than a scratch. May just start the wind up because she's new and all. I hope you're right. We probably ran into some poor old whale, and they're having a board of directors Mr. meeting Phillips. about it. Send out the international distress signal immediately. Yes, sir. Todd Hunter is on deck now. Come in, Todd Hunter. The passengers here in first class were all alerted a little while ago and are now coming up to take their place in the lifeboat. No one knows exactly yet what's happened, but no one seems particularly alarmed. It seems inconceivable that such a slight bump, if indeed that's what it was, could have damaged a ship like the Titanic. Those are the passengers who aren't annoyed at being called out of bed in the middle of a cold night are taking the whole procedure as some kind of stunt. Oh, Colonel Astor. Colonel Astor. Yes. Uh, do you know what's happening? What? I say, do you know what's happening? Some sort of drill, I guess. It must be our ship, huh? Well, we're not getting into this, Ooh. are we? Women and children. Now, mister. Well, isn't there room for everyone else? Women and children, madam. That's all I was told. Aren't there enough boats? Attention, Why aren't there enough boats? Uh, don't, don't worry ahead about the boats. Certainly there are enough boats. Well, it's really an elementary precaution that they, that's always taken. Women and children first. It's uh, kind of a tradition, isn't it? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, old Captain Smith, he's a, he's a stickler for tradition. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll be in one of the other boats right behind you. Now get in, honey. Uh, uh, don't worry. But why? There isn't any danger, is there? Said the Titanic couldn't sink. So it can't. You're absolutely sure, aren't you? Okay. Oh, it doesn't matter a tinker's dam whether I'm sure or not. What's important is that Lloyds of London insured this ship for the lowest marine rate it's ever given. Does that convince you? Well, I suppose it's Lloyds. There'll be another boat for you, won't there, darling? I can't see anything but boats. I'll be able to get one of them. Be long as fast as I can. Get that boat pulled clear as soon as it's free. Captain Smith, Captain Smith. Yes, sir. Is the ship badly damaged? Yes, it is. Can you tell us what happened? We collided with an iceberg, hit the part that is underwater. I've ordered all passengers into the lifeboats. Watch those falls when you lower away. See, it doesn't get fouled up in the hook. Mr. Hoyt, number two boat on the starboard side will be ready to lower in five minutes. I suggest you put your wife into it. My wife's boat was just lowered. Sir. What's the damage? We're ripped from stem to stern. Below the water line? Yes, from the four peak to number five boiler room. Splashed as though you'd done it with a knife. The gash must be some 300 foot long. And 14 foot of water in the forest compartment within the first 10 minutes. Pumps can't take care of it? No. You'd better get into a boat yourself. Regardless of your boat number, proceed to starboard boat deck. Is my wife's boat still close to the ship? I believe so, sir. But you can't tell them there's anything really wrong. The boats are pulling away half empty. Some of them. I'll give you a hand with the other boats. You'll probably need it. Wilcox has gone.
gone to other parts of the ship to see how the evacuation is going on. Come in, Harlow Wilcox. I'm down here in the steerage of the Titanic, where an attempt is being made to get the steerage passengers out of the lifeboats. The seaman assigned to this job seems to be having some difficulty. <laughs> Look, look, I'm trying to give it to you straight and simple. The ship's sinking. It's going down, see? And all the women and children I want out to the boat. Out to the boat. See? See? No. Look, the ship's in trouble. Trouble. Sick. Sick. Oh. Isn't there anybody in here that speaks English, Mum? Hi, lady. Now, listen, listen. Look, the ship's in trouble. It's going down. And I want all the women and children out to the boat folks too late. Better get a move on, Jocko. She ain't got much longer to go. Well, what are we going to do with these? I can't make them understand me. That's their lookout. You better get topside before you go down with them. Well, it's as bad as that. Mortal, Jocko. Riley. Mortal. Now, listen. Listen, this ship is going to go down any minute. Right down, see? Down. Yeah, down. Huh? Don't you understand? Come here. Look, I want your kids and your women all out to the boats before it's too late. Do you understand? Don't you understand? No, touch me, lad. It's, it's the time for an out. Now, come on. Here. Oh, lady. Oh, I'm not going to hurt you, kid. I'm trying to save you. Can't even get it through your head. Better get a move on. Number six boiler room's flooded. Six boiler. Back to Todd Hunter on deck. Come in, Todd Hunter. The boats are still pulling away from the ship. Some of the passengers are beginning to realize now this is no joke, that the Titanic is really in trouble. But there is no panic, and the evacuation proceeds quietly. Captain Smith? Oh, Captain Smith. Hmm? Are other ships coming to your rescue? The ship has been sighted a few miles off to port. She hasn't responded to our wireless as yet, but we're sending up rockets. She should see them soon. Have any responded to the wireless? Uh, yes, a few. The Carpathia is the nearest. She should be here in a few hours. Will that be time enough? We'll have to see. Yes, Phillips. My assistant's on the key, sir. Good. We've got the Frankfurt now. She's a German ship, sir. Also the Mount Temple and the Baltic. They're all on the way. Uh, any further news from the Carpathia? Still coming full speed, sir. They're doing the best they can. Good. Just... One thing, sir, if it can be done, there's a terrible amount of steam being let off. Well, the engineers are reducing steam. We can hardly afford any explosions at this point. I realize that, sir, but the signals are rather faint now. We need all the quiet we can get, otherwise we can't hear them. Very well. I'll see what can be done to decrease the noise. Thank you, sir. Good. I'll take care of it, sir, but I wanted, well. to, I wanted to tell you the two forward compartments are completely flooded. They're using the emergency dynamos now. I've ordered the firemen out, but the engineers insist on staying. They say that if they keep the pumps going all along, that that we'll stay afloat at the longer. How long do they give her? Oh, an hour, maybe two, sir. Hardly time enough for the Carpathia to get here. Has that ship to port off its course any? Well, get the boats away and see that they're all full. And remember, women and children first. Very well, sir. Women and children We'll return you to the deck in just a moment. Meanwhile, for coverage of the activities below, here is Dick Joy in one of the engine rooms. This is Dick Joy. We're just inside the bulkhead of engine room 7, and we'll try to find out what the situation is. You, sir, may we ask you a few questions? Yes. Could you tell us how things are going down here? Well, we're not flooded in this compartment yet, if that's what you mean. Well, just why are you letting steam off from the boilers? A prevented explosion. If there's a full lead of steam and cold seawater breaks through and hits a boiler, it'll blow sky high. I could send it to the bottom class. Didn't Captain Smith order all you engineers to go above? It wasn't exactly an order. We knew we had to keep the pressure down, and the pumps had to be manned. Well, then you feel there's still a chance to save the ship? Not a chance. But with the pumps out of operation, she'd make a dive in a matter of minutes. This way, we may be able to keep it afloat for an hour or so. Give her a chance to get most of the passengers off. Lawrence will help arrive. Well, how will you know when to go above yourselves for your own safety? Uh, don't worry about me. Uh, excuse me. That's all from engine room seven. And again, we return you to the main deck. I want 
you to get in this boat. There's no sense in you staying here. No. I'll be all right. There's no need to worry about me. You're being very foolish. I won't leave you. After all this time together, I, I wouldn't know what to do without you. But it's just being sensible. Would you like to go inside and sit down? Well, Mr. Hoyt. Well, Captain. Looks cold down there. It is. Well, at least it will give me some sort of a chance. I don't suppose you... No. Stupid of me. Sorry. Well, goodbye, Captain. Good luck, Mr. Hoyt. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Burdock. Last boat to Johnson. Good. Is the ship's orchestra up on deck? Yes, sir. Have them play something if they're up to it, please, Mr. Murdoch. Captain Smith, sir. Yes, steward. Passenger on B deck, I wish to report, sir. Report what for? Smashing in company properties, sir. Breaking down doors. Pulling mattresses off beds. Says he's going to make some sort of a draft with them. Well, I tell you, sir, I'm responsible for that, and the regulation says that any... Steward. Yes, sir. Your devotion to your company is admirable. I shall always remember Thank it. Thank you, sir. And now, I suggest you do something about leaving the ship before she sinks. Sinks? Exactly. But I'm responsible to the company, sir. Yes, steward. So am I. You think the orchestra could play as a hymn, Mr. Murdoch? Undoubtedly, sir. You seem to understand the situation fairly well. Yes, sir. How about the rockets, Mr. Murdoch? We've sent up the last of the sensor. There's nothing more we can do. No, I don't suppose there is. Well, I shall go up to the bridge. Goodbye, Mr. Murdoch. Goodbye, Captain. Two and a half hours after scraping the side of the iceberg, the Titanic sank to the bottom of the sea. She went quietly, her bow dipping deeper and deeper into the water until her stern stood straight up in the air. Then gently and gracefully, she slid beneath the waves while the horrified survivors watched from the half-empty lifeboats. Two hours later, the SS Carpathia came on the scene and took aboard the survivors 712 passengers and crew members. Going down with the ship were 1,517 men, women, and children. The sinking of the unsinkable Titanic broke over the Western world like an earthquake. Investigations were immediately held, both in the United States and Great Britain, but no blame ever was really assessed. Certified to carry more than 3,000 persons, the Titanic had lifeboats for only 1,100. Yet the irony of the disaster was that not even these were filled, so confident were the passengers in the myth of the unsinkable ship. The other tragic irony was that throughout that terrible night, another ship, the SS Californian, lay just a few miles away with their radio operator off-duty deaf to the wireless signals tapped out by the stricken ship and heedless of the distress rockets set up by the Titanic. The only tangible result of the tragedy was that a system of ice patrols was instigated for the North Atlantic to warn ships of the ice danger. But it came too late to save the greatest ship of its day, the noble and ill-fated Titanic. What sort of a day was it? A day like all days, filled with those events that alter and illuminate our time. And you were there. <laughs>